Welcome to our video channel. Don't forget to subscribe for more great railway videos. Selamat datang di channel video kami. Jangan lupa subscribe untuk update video-video terbaru kami. A new breed of locomotives is rolling down the railways of the world. Revolutionary technology has overcome traditional barriers to produce trains unlike any before. Super diesels pull mile-long trains. High-speed locomotives cover miles in mere seconds. And trains of the future that will travel using levitation. Each super train is a product of challenge and innovation, begun decades ago, when great steam locomotives ruled the rails. High-speed trains are traveling the world. This super-speed train is the TGV. It is the world's fastest commercial train. Traveling faster than some airplanes fly, it can cover 150 miles in less time than it will take to watch this program. Many nations have super trains that clock over 100 miles per hour on regularly scheduled runs. For two decades, bullet trains have been streaking between Tokyo and Osaka, carrying over one billion passengers. Average speed, 150 miles an hour. No one is standing still when it comes to pushing the technology even further. Using the latest advancements in design, construction, and testing, Transportation scientists and engineers are developing new methods to move cargo and people by rail. The push for better and more efficient railroads has created a breed of locomotives that is unlike any which preceded them. Super trains of today are technological marvels. Their advancement is shattering the very concept of rail travel. However, their story is a story that began when super trains belched smoke and sucked steam, but hauled the world into a new age. Union Pacific's fleet of locomotives was one of the most powerful, their designers always pushing the technology of the day to new limits. Well, bigger, more powerful locomotives evolved from the, from the same thing that bigger, more powerful diesels are evolving from nowadays. It's a never-ending story. Uh, the size and weight of the freight and passenger cars and the amount of cargo they carry has always grown. And about the time a designer comes up with what he considers to be the ultimate locomotive, some other designer comes up with a bigger, heavier freight car, or the railroad needs to run the trains faster to uh, service customers. And that's been going on since railroads first came around. Starting in 1936, Union Pacific built a beast of a locomotive that dwarfed all others. Stronger than two of today's diesels, more powerful than 100 full-size automobiles. Water circulated through more than a mile of pipes. Its massive boiler generated a red-hot cyclone of superheated steam 
that drove four cylinders, each larger than a 40-gallon drum. Its mighty engine throbbed with over 5,500 horsepower and weighed over one million pounds. That's more than two empty 747s. They called it the Challenger. You look at these things and, and you have to remind yourself that these things were designed on a drawing board. They were designed with slide rules and stuff like that. There was no computer-aided design or any of that kind of stuff. There was no way to do stress tests. This was all done by rooms and rooms full of engineers, uh, hunched over draft boards with the slide rule and pens and pencils and stuff like that. And they were built in American factories. They were built the, the, the hard way, you might say, uh, the good old blue collar worker, the old industrial base of, of the country. And when you look at it that way, it's pretty good solid engineering. It's good American craftsmanship. And it's, it represents an era that isn't there now. Now everything's made out of plastic, everything's designed on computers, and I'm not saying that's bad, it's just different. The Challenger was designed for fast freight, but occasionally pulled passenger trains. It had a top speed of about 70 miles per hour. Power was supplied by 12 driving wheels, each almost six feet tall. It was referred to as a 4664, meaning four wheels in the leading pilot to help guide the locomotive into curves, two sets of six driving wheels, and finally, four trailing wheels, which support the rear of the engine and its massive firebox. Each set of driving wheels had its own steam cylinder, the result, in essence, is two engines under one boiler. But even its strength wasn't up to hauling freight over the Continental Divide. The curves and steep grades of the Rocky Mountains seemed an impenetrable barrier for locomotives of the era, even more than the strength of the Challenger could master. A larger locomotive was needed, so Union Pacific decided to build one. Some thought it couldn't be done because the tight curves in the track would be impossible for such an enormous beast to negotiate. Critical design problems that resulted from the size and length of this new locomotive had to be overcome. The extra length would mandate the need to advance a revolutionary design used on the Challengers. This was known as articulation. They couldn't go up because they had reached the, the limits of height. They couldn't go to the sides because they'd reached a limit of width. But they could go lengthwise. And when you have a locomotive that's going to be 130 or 132 feet long, uh, it won't go around any kind of curve at all if it's rigid. So they came up with, with the articulation. An articulated locomotive is one that is actually hinged in the middle, or the running gear is, not the boiler, but the running gear is. The front part of the boiler rests on a sliding plate and there's a hinge pin in the middle of the locomotive. So the front half of the running gear can ease into a curve while the boiler stays straight. The articulated design helped to make possible the most powerful locomotive that ever rolled down a track. A titan among giants. It was the first and last of its kind. It was named Big Boy. There were 56 of these enormous locomotives built. They generated 7,300 horsepower, weighed over 600 tons, and were half the length of a football field. It had a wheel arrangement of 4884, giving it more power and making it 10 feet longer than the Challenger. Its strength was legendary. These locomotives could pull long trains up the steepest grades. They conquered the Rocky Mountains without breaking a sweat. The Big Boy was the largest steam locomotive ever built. It was 135 feet long. It uh, had 16 driving wheels, it had four cylinders. It had an enormous boiler and grate area. It was coal fired. It had a tender on behind it that would carry 32 tons of coal and 25,000 gallons of, of water. 
so in the 4000, which is the big boy, you wound up with a lot of tractive effort, not quite as much horsepower as you might want. The big boy and the Challenger were kind of designed as a package. So at the top of the hill, you traded that locomotive for one that had a little less tractive effort, but a lot more horsepower. Because now you're going across the prairies, now you want the speed. So rather than compete against each other, the Challenger hauled the high speed runs, while the big boy conquered the steep grades. In the two, steam engine technology had reached its pinnacle of size and power. But fundamentally, both behemoths operated like any other basic steam engine. Water and fuel are fed into the boiler from the tender coupled behind the locomotive. From the firebox, hot gases flow forward. The high pressure steam expands in large cylinders. The cylinders move pistons that are connected to rods that turn the driving wheels. For the Big Boy and Challenger, this process was doubled and superheated steam was created in order to power both sets of drivers. The steam locomotive was a cantankerous, fragile beast. No two were the same. Each had a personality of its own. Steam locomotive doesn't do anything for itself. You're continually adjusting the machine to do the amount of work that you want in the most efficient manner. And you do that by, by what it's telling you. And it talks to you through the seat of your pants, and it talks to you through your ears, and it's telling you what it wants, and if you don't give it what it wants, it'll bite you. It's always been said that the best engine crews kind of bonded with the machine. This kinship between man and machine forged by the iron horse has never been matched. Perhaps it was the sense that each were, in their own way, running against time. A steam locomotive consumes itself. Every time you build a fire in it and steam it up and every time it moves a little bit, it's slowly wearing itself out. And that's one of the natures of the beast. But the downfall of all steam locomotives was their fuel consumption. In terms of, of how much fuel they used for the power they put out, they were horribly inefficient compared to a diesel. On a typical run, these locomotives would consume one ton of coal per mile, turn 25,000 gallons of water into steam, and require a stop every 20 to 30 miles to replenish its supply. The transition from steam to diesel started rather slowly, kind of at the behest of people who saw something in the diesel that they didn't see in steam. It stayed slow until World War II, when they couldn't get diesels. But after World War II, the change became very rapid. And between the end of World War II and probably the middle 1950s, steam disappeared from commercial service.